I'm Pastor Joe Jackowitz, your host and Bible teacher. It's a blessing to be back with you after a one week, actually not a week break. We uh, left uh, after last Wednesday, but it's good to be back with you. Welcome. If you're new to the Bible study, we are glad to have you with us. <clears throat> Let me begin by reminding you if you have any questions about the Bible study or on any topic, actually, we will have about 15 or 20 minutes of Q&A at the end of the Bible study. So get a pencil and paper, write those questions down or get ready to write them down, not only on the matter of marriage and the specific topic related to marriage, but on any Bible question whatsoever. So now's the time to do it. And you can send us your questions, even your comments on the message section on Facebook or on YouTube. Just message us on Facebook and YouTube with your question or comment. You can also send us an email, a direct email to our church website. The email address is on our church website, which is uh, ChristBibleChurch.org, or you can just go ahead and write the email address directly at cbc at christbiblechurch.org. That's cbc at christbiblechurch.org. Those are the three ways you can ask us a question or make a comment on YouTube or Facebook message or the email address cbc at christbiblechurch.org. Peter constantly checks all three of those reception areas for your questions. Now, by way of free offer, our free offer this week are two books. Write this website down, firstloveministries.org. That's one word, firstloveministries.org. And on the homepage, click on First Love Publications. There'll be uh, a catalog that will come up as well as click on the order form. And the first book is In the Footprints of the Lamb by George Steinberger. Steinberger, my tongue isn't working right tonight. George Steinberger, and this is the best book on Christian love I have ever read. If you're struggling with the love of God, or to maintain the love of God, or to love your enemies, or to even love your wives, your husbands, and your fiancés, go ahead and order this book, and you will truly be blessed. It's only about 63, 60, yeah, 63 pages, and it's a short read, but it's a quality read. Don't speed read through this book. The second book is titled Systematic Theology by Dr. W.R. Downing a very good friend of mine, and this book is very, very unique. It has a lot of practical application in it, unlike most systematic theologies. Every major doctrine in the Bible is defined and explained in this book with many cross-references. It's an excellent book for research, for Bible study, for Sunday school class. It's a great book for sermon preparation, and also to give away. So you can get both of these books. We will send you both at the same time, free and postage paid, if you order them through our website at firstloveministries.org. All right, let's go ahead with that in mind, and let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that you would draw near to us, that we might draw near to you that we might understand your word and the truth of the doctrine of marriage. Help those who are struggling to grasp what we will bring forth tonight. Help them to humble themselves and apply this truth to their lives. And bless us, Lord. Thank you for each one who has attended the study tonight. We pray that you would change us and help us to be transformed through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Okay, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the next major theme in our four thematic series on the single Christian life, dating, courtship, and marriage. And this is the fourth message on Christian marriage. Last time we looked at the characteristics of a godly wife. If you're single, a single young man or a middle-aged man, and you're looking for a godly wife, we're first of all covering the personal qualities you ought to be looking for and praying about in a future spouse. Last time we looked at the first one is that a godly wife is trustworthy. Second, she builds others up. Third, she is diligent. And fourth, her priorities are in order. And you can look at the previous message and get the explanation and teaching on all four of those qualities of a godly life if you go to our YouTube site at Christ Bible Church uh, on the search bar, Christ Bible Church, and Christian marriage number three, the characteristics of a godly life, which should be the last one that was posted about four or five days ago. These videos are posted by our brother Peter in chronological order. So just go back one or two videos to the study that you're looking for. This would be part two of characteristics of a godly life in the series on Christian marriage. This series will be quite broad and deep. We want to cover pretty much every major aspect of Christian marriage, including problems and struggles, giving as much practical advice that I can possibly give in my 41 years as a pastor and as a marriage counselor. All right, so let's then move on and look at the fifth characteristic of a godly life. What's the fifth thing you should be looking for, young men? And single women, what should you be praying about that God would mold you and fashion you into? in terms of a godly wife? How should you prepare for a marriage in the development of your character so that you are not completely without any understanding and any godliness when you marry your husband? Well, the fifth one is that a godly wife is industrious and nurturing. A godly wife is industrious and nurturing. What do I mean by that? Well, we've been using Proverbs chapter 31 as the basis of our teaching on this. Proverbs 31 and Titus chapter 2 are the two longest and richest passages in the Bible that describe both the character of a godly woman and her work. And what is her role in the home and her in, in, in her relationship with her husband. So if you turn over to Proverbs 31, we will read verse 15. We've looked at verses 10 through 14 and verse 27 of Proverbs 31. Tonight we'll look at verse 15 of Proverbs 31. I wonder while you're turning there, how serious you are. If you're a woman and you're single, whether you're in your late teens, 20s, 30s, or even older, 50s, 60s, you've never been married, you've been praying and praying and praying for God to send you a husband who is godly in a day and age in which there's such a low supply of godly leaders, godly husbands, godly fathers, and you haven't found one, all you've been confronted with are worldly men in the church, and you're praying that God will send you a holy husband. And I know that husbands are praying for holy and godly wives. And so you ought to be listening carefully and be praying about these characteristics, that God would give you grace to become what Proverbs 31 teaches us about a godly woman. In verse 15, it says that this godly woman, she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. 
The godly woman has such a character, she doesn't let the grass grow under her feet. She does her part in providing for her household. No, the husband is the breadwinner, he's the primary provider, but she does what she can to stretch the budget, to stretch the household provisions, to preserve the house in its resources, She's industrious. She doesn't sit at home watching TV all night. She doesn't say, well, the husband's the provider. I can just sit home and twiddle my thumbs all day long and watch soap operas. No, no. Proverbs here in verse 15, 31, 15 says, she also rises while it is yet night. She doesn't punch a clock, a nine to five. Well, it's five o'clock. Time to have dinner and then settle in for the evening. No, it doesn't work like that. She is depicted here as working hard and industrious even in the nighttime. Doesn't another place, Ecclesiastes, I believe, say, sow you your seed in the morning and sow your seed in the evening because you do not know which one the Lord will bless. And so the godly woman is industrious. She's working day and night whenever she has the opportunity to maintain a household that is run decently and in order and that adds value and resources to what her husband brings home in terms of a paycheck. It doesn't mean she works 24-7 or works every waking moment and, and therefore has no time for her personal devotions. She doesn't walk with God and she has very little strength or interest in the rest of the family, including her husband, because she's working all day and night. No, that's not what it means. It means that when the opportunity arises as God strengthens her, she's always looking for opportunities to get the most out of the resources they have to keep an orderly home and so forth. And especially this is true for a working woman. If you are a wife and you're in a position where for now you have to work, your husband requires you to work or has asked you to work, and you find when you come home from work, whether it be part-time or full-time work, you have very little strength left and you have to wait for that second wind, as it were, in the early evening or middle evening time to get up and clean and cook and prepare for the next day and get things ready. That's not easy. Your goal should be as to be a full-time homemaker. But you need to be industrious if you're going to be working a full-time job, even a part-time job, 20 or 30 hours a week, and be industrious. It says, she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. Not only does she stay up late at night, but when she doesn't, many times she gets up early, even two, three, four o'clock in the morning. I've read biographies of godly women, wives, who get up at two, three, four o'clock in the morning because in order to maintain a godly lifestyle and a godly walk, that is the reading and meditating of the scriptures. She's needing to get up an hour or two or even three before dawn. Walk with God and then begin work early while it is still night. And so she, she supports her husband in cooking the food, in preparing the food, in providing the food for her household, including a portion for her maidservants. Back then in these cultures, women who were industrious brought in extra money that uh, they could afford uh, a maid or a servant back then, a woman to help with the chores, especially if they had a large family. And so in preparing food for the household, she also made extra for the servants of the house. And so we see this, this industrious woman, this diligent woman. What about you? Well, if you are inherently lazy, if you have hormones and chromosomes that have passed on to you where either it causes you to be lazy or lack energy or you get fatigued very easily, 
If it's a medical problem, that's one thing. It's certainly something you should be praying about and seeking medical advice about. But if you are just lazy for lazy sake, you need to be praying about this because your husband, and even more than your husband, the Lord, the Lord wants you to obey this, this pathway he has for a, a Christian wife to be industrious and diligent. Okay, number six, the sixth characteristic of a godly wife is that she is frugal and prudent with finances. She is frugal and prudent with finances. And this requires wisdom from God. Now, a husband doesn't work hard and provide a living for his family and for his wife for his wife to spend that money on anything she wants to spend it on. Personal luxury items, fanciful personal things that are vain in and themselves, that do not bring productivity and household resources to the family. We need to be frugal and prudent in the spending of our finances because they're not, it's not our money. If your future husband delegates to you the oversight of the family budget and asks you to pay the bills, there are certain cultures that have the wife handle the finances. It's a cultural thing, but it's not necessarily a biblical um, delegation. The husband makes the decision on who handles the finances, whether he alone or a combination of he and his wife, or he delegates it to his wife with instructions to be a faithful steward of the finances. The husband should also have a discussion with his wife of that's what he wants to do, at least temporarily, until he sees that she can handle the finances and follows biblical guidelines and principles of spending God's money, that um, she handles the Lord's resources properly and spends that money properly. We're living in a day and an age where inflation is through the roof. You know this. Uh, buying power in many places is one third or one half less of what it used to be just a year ago. And people are living on a very tight budget. Many are working two jobs to make a go of it. The cost of living in many places throughout the United States and the West is very high. And it requires a lot of frugality and careful budgeting in spending the household finances. It's not your money, wife. Remember that. If you're going to be a wife, a Christian wife, and you and your fiancé have already discussed how the finances are going to be handled, that you're going to bring your finances together, keep them in one account, and you're going to follow biblical guidelines on its spending, there's a rule, a very important rule to follow. Live beneath your means. That means live in such a way and do not take on financial obligations in a way that would have you spend more money than you take in. It's common sense. You should live in a way where your fixed expenses, that is, those expenses that you must spend every month, your rent or your mortgage, your food, your insurance, your electric, uh, utility bills, that you still have a certain portion of money left over every paycheck after your fixed expenses are paid, whether that be 10%, 20% or more. And of course, you need to devote a portion of that to the, Lord, the Lord's work in giving financially to the Lord's ministry in church. You should put a portion of it away in savings, uh, like the ant we learn in Proverbs, uh, follow the wisdom of the ant who puts away some food for a rainy day. Go, learn from the ant, Solomon said. Consider the ant and learn his ways. And so you should live in a way where you have discipline 
not to take on yourself more financial commitments through credit card spending because you want something so bad. Oh, you need that, that hat. You need that brand new dress. Oh, you so, you so much want to, to buy your oldest child that $300 Lego set that you don't have the money to spend on for Christmas and you have to go into debt for it. Be wise, be wise. Don't spend money that you don't have. Don't go into debt or credit. Be frugal and be prudent. It's the Lord's money. The Lord gave it to you. He provided you the health, the skills, the ability, and the job to earn at a job enough money to have discretionary spending left over after the paycheck. And what? You're going to spend it on things of the world and on things you don't need and go into debt for those things? That's shameful. That's making God Lord of many areas of your life except your finances. And so we read in Proverbs 31 and verse 16, Proverbs 31 verse 16, regarding the godly wife, she considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands holds the spindle. This is a picture of an industrious woman that we looked at in the last point, number five. But an industrious woman will end up earning extra money on top of what her husband brings home, which will provide extra funds for the household. It'll provide an overflow from the household. And what does she do with the, her money? It says in this extra money, in verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. Notice the word consider. It means that she thinks about the price of the field, the location of the field, and she's looking at more than just making an investment in real estate as, as an, an, an investment to gain equity and just build up equity and savings and profit in a savings account, so to speak, to use today's financial uh, standards. No, she considers a field and buys it for what purpose? Look at the next phrase. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. So she's using her extra money that she brought in because she's industrious and she worked day and then she worked at night and that extra funds she brought in at night, she saved. And what she did is she looked at buying a field, some property in order to plant a vineyard. That is, she bought that to provide more resources and food for the household. It was an investment in stabilizing the household's nourishment and nutritional stability to plant a vineyard, to continue to bring in food and drink to the household. So she made an investment in the, in the nourishment of the family by buying that field. It, there was a specific purpose, not just to spend money on her lusts because she wanted to grow grapes and produce wine and get drunk, no. Verse 18 says, she perceives that her merchandise is good. This indicates that she's maintaining the quality of what she produces. Not only does she just purchase a field to bring in extra food for the house, but she wants to maintain the highest level of quality in that product. And her lamp does not go out by night. And she stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold a spindle. Not only does she invest some money in real estate to be able to grow more food and bring that into the household to provide and to help her husband, but also she doesn't just focus on real estate and farming to help the family. It says that she holds the spindle. 
That's sewing and weaving. She produces clothing. She, she's learned another gift besides farming and growing food in a garden. She's learned how to sew. I remember my, in my youth, and my, my grandmother was not a believer. She was Jewish. In Brooklyn, New York, my mother told me that my grandmother and my grandfather didn't have extra money. They were of the, the lower class Jews of New York City. My grandfather was a cab driver, and my grandmother was a clerk, the lowest level clerk for the city of New York. But they were very hard workers. And so my grandmother wanted to send my mother to a ballet school to learn ballet. They sent my uncle, her, my mother's brother, to Juilliard School of Music, which is the top, top school of music in the United States. And where did they get this money as a cab driver and a low-level clerk? Well, my mother, my grandmother took on sewing in the evening for hours. She would three or four hours a night, five nights a week, she would sew various, uh, you know, Afghans and various sweaters and products along that line, and she would sell it. She had an outlet to sell it. And she earned that extra money, pennies on a dollar, and she saved it and saved it and was able to send my uncle Jack to Juilliard School of Music and my mother to ballet, a very high quality ballet school in New York City. This is what we're talking about, a picture of a frugal and prudent person with finances. You know, there's many depictions of the excellent godly wife in Proverbs 31, including diligence and responsibility. The Proverbs 31 woman is seen both literally and symbolically as bringing in to the household necessary supplies, uh, as we've looked at, including verse 14. It says, she is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She's like the merchant ship. She's wise in business. She's wise in handling the family's money. And she makes good business decisions. In verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. She doesn't just go off, doesn't just go off half cocked and just spend money on anything wildly. She thinks about it. She researches the matter before she spends the money. And so her profitable and wise spending habits are very commendable. God commends this godly woman. And the metaphor that's used here in uh, verse um, 16 and uh, seven, or verse uh, 18, the, the lamp does not go out at night. This metaphor of a lamp is a symbol which implies foresight, planning, and sustained success. She's thinking ahead of time. She's planning ahead of time. The lamp or the light that's burning brightly late into the night shows the image and the, and the picture of a woman sitting at, at her kitchen table with the lamp there, with a pencil and paper in hand, scratching her head, thinking deep, maybe praying as she's thinking, Lord, direct me, how do I spend this money? Lead me in the path I should go and deciding if I should buy this field or buy this place or buy this little piece of property so we can grow, we can grow a big garden. She's thinking about it. And so the lamp is a metaphor for hard work both thoughtfully and physically. It also implies, like I said, planning. And uh, this was part of the lesson in Jesus' parable of the 10 virgins. The five virgins who were faithful uh, kept their lamps burning, looking for the bridegroom. And so diligence and frugality and prudence in spending money implies planning. And this was part, like I said, of the matter of diligence in approaching finances. 
If a lamp goes out at night, it results in darkness. And the godly woman, however, looks ahead, plans ahead, so her family is supplied and cared for during hard times. You know, I've known a lot of godly women in my time as a believer of almost 50 years, and I've seen women shopping, Christian women shopping with children in tow, with a baby in a knapsack, and they're price comparing, price shopping in different stores, and they're not wasting any time. They're going from one store to another. Of course, we can now do all those things online and save ourselves a lot of tire tread and gas and miles on the car. But women who are frugal and who are industrious and diligent, they take advantage of the means, even the technology, to price compare and get the, get the best deal for their dollar. And I've been blessed to know a number of them. Okay, number seven. Let's move on to the characteristics of a godly woman. Number seven, she is ready for any task. She's ready. She doesn't confine herself just to this very narrow job, quote, responsibility, unquote, of doing one or two things as a godly homemaker. It says in verse 17 of Proverbs 31, she girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. And so this means that not only is she willing to engage in hard work, and be frugal and industrious, she does whatever needs to be done. She girds herself with strength. That is, she does whatever she has to do to train, to learn, to be equipped, to be skilled, and to be ready physically, emotionally, mentally, to do any task that needs to be done to help her husband and to help the household. Instead of handing off very important tasks to others or simply doing nothing when her husband suggests, you know, I need some help in this thing. I, I just don't have enough time. She volunteers and says, well, honey, I don't know a whole lot about that, but I can learn. I can learn. I'll let you know what I, f I find out tonight when you come home from work. She's ready for every task instead of being lazy or sitting home doing nothing. Even if the work isn't glamorous, she applies herself with enthusiasm. She doesn't flinch from doing what is stereotypically considered man, man's work. There are other tasks in this passage of Proverbs 31 that aren't necessarily meant to define a woman's job in a narrow sense, a woman's job, like I said at the outset of this point. But she's ready to do, do it if that's what she's called upon to help in uh, her husband. She's ready for any test. That's a characteristic of a godly woman. Enthusiastic, positive, ready to go because the Lord gives her joy, enthusiasm in her heart to be the best wife that she could possibly be. All right, number eight, characteristic of a godly woman, number eight. By the way, write your questions down and send them right now, because we have about 10 minutes left in the study, to uh, Brother Peter on the message section of Facebook and YouTube, or send us an email with your questions about marriage, not only about the characteristics of a godly woman, but any question about marriage or premarital counseling or resolving certain marriage problems. Do you have a marriage problem? Are you caught in the thicket of hostility, arguments, disagreements, and you're depressed, you're struggling, you don't know how to get yourself out of a jam with your husband and it's going on a week, two weeks, a month, a year, and you have not resolved really critical issues, give us or send us an email and we'll seek to answer that question. The email address, direct email is cbc at christbiblechurch.org. That's cbc at christbiblechurch.org. 
Okay, number eight, the godly woman is kind, compassionate, and self-giving. And by the way, let me add one more point to this matter of the need to be industrious and frugal in the house. If you tend to be on the lazy side, and if you tend to overspend money because of some dysfunctional habit that was ingrained in you from, from as far back as you can remember, you didn't have a good example of, of spending when it comes to finances in a father or a mother, and you got caught up in a bad habit, and every time you got your allowance or you got a hold of some money or you got your paycheck, within one or two days it's spent. The whole thing is gone. You need to be praying right now, God, teach me to be a good steward of the finances. You need to be praying, God, train me, retrain me, re-educate me on how to be a good steward of resources so that when I get married, my husband will trust me with the household finances. And I, even more than my husband's trust, I will be faithful to you, to you who has given me this responsibility. The Bible says he that is faithful in little is faithful in much. And if you can't be faithful with a um, $1,000 a week budget or uh, a $5,000 a month budget, as your husband's job gets better and better in terms of financial remuneration, in terms of promotions and raises that he gets, how are you gonna be able to spend that money, the Lord's money that your husband earns and that you bring in perhaps as well, once your budget grows double and triple because God has blessed you and added to your household much more income than you have right now. How are you gonna be faithful with much if you can't be faithful with a little bit? That's why right now, right now, train yourself when your budget is smaller to stick strictly with discipline to a monthly budget and don't go over the budget except in a rare emergency, rare emergency. Okay, so number eight, she is kind, compassionate, and self-giving. Let's look at Proverbs 31 and verse 20. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hand to the needy. With all this work going on, with all this budgeting of funds and taking care of the household and the children and her husband's needs, the godly woman fi finds time to be compassionate, to give to the poor. She goes out of our way. Her character is a Christian and the love of God in her is driving her to make the time to do good works based on love, based on the love of God. And as part of describing an ideal wife in Proverbs 31.10, who can find a virtuous wife with godly characteristics? This passage refers to, in verse 20, a charitable, generous spirit. Now, does not that depict and manifest the character of a godly woman? She's generous. She's charitable. She's kind. She's giving. In contrast, the Bible condemns those who are greedy and covetousness, who are hoarders. I've known some, some ladies, the husband pulls his hair out because she hoards everything and she's professing to be a Christian. She has a garage full of stuff where there's only like a one foot narrow passage where they can walk through the garage barely and get through and the husband the husband, every time he brings up, dear, we, we need to do something with this stuff in the garage, this clutter. And the, the wife will shut him down, cut him up. No, no, no. I may need that stuff someday. You've, you've had it for 35, 40 years. My, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a hoarder. I don't like clutter. And if it doesn't have, a, for me, that's for me, and I'm not, speaking for anyone else, for me, if it doesn't have a useful purpose, within a month or two, it's gone. Even I'll give it away. Um, and so we need to be givers. It is more blessed to give 
than to receive. And those who are greedy, those who are covetous, those who are hoarders, who don't show generosity and don't give of themselves to others and of their resources to others, who don't follow the, the principle that if you're, if you're, if someone asks you to give your coat, give your cloak also. Always have an attitude that you're ready to give up anything that you own so that you don't maintain an idolatrous spirit. No, I'm not going to give that up. If God wants you to, if the Lord wants you to give something up, it will be a test of whether or not you've made an idol out of it. And, um, and covetousness and greed and avarice are characteristics of wicked people, of lost people. Some, some of you, before your conversion, you struggled with greed and covetousness and envy. You always envied those who had more stuff than you did. And there are many people out there, and Proverbs speaks to them, who take advantage of the poor. They take advantage of people who are less fortunate than they are. But we read in Proverbs 31, verses 13 and 14, that um, this person who's earned this extra money because she's industrious and diligent, the Bible says that very often we, we're given extra skills to bring in extra money that we don't really need. God doesn't promise to give us a double budget so we could spend the extra money on anything we want. He says, with food and with clothing, let us therewith be content. But very often the blessing of God is such that because of diligence and because we have the right attitude about money and we share and we give to the poor, God says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. In other words, who knows that God has not brought in abundantly so that you have much more money than you ever imagined, specifically so you can do good works with it as a Christian and approach these labors and works with a godly attitude of sympathy, compassion, kindness, generosity for those who are in need. And God forbid that you would neglect the church, the direct repository of where you should be giving your gifts, your financial gifts to, for the work of the church, for the work of evangelism, for the work of preaching the gospel, track distribution, supporting those who are called full-time full in ministry and part-time. This is the first work financially. And so a godly woman is going to have a compassionate, generous spirit in helping those who not only are poor and needy outside the church, but the needs in the church as well. And husbands or future husbands, this is what you ought to be looking for in a Christian wife. I thank God for a wife who regularly comes to me and brings up to my attention the needs of others so that we can reach out and help because her heart is very compassionate towards the needs of the poor. All right, lastly, very quickly, number nine, the ninth characteristic of a godly wife and husbands, by the way, you ought not to marry someone who can't handle finances. Two things will ruin a marriage more than any others. Um, sex and finances. Sex and money. They will destroy a marriage. I've seen it happen a thousand times. You want to marry a godly woman who is content with the funds that you bring into the house, even though your husband even though you, if you are a man, make just above minimum wage. Mm. You don't get married for money, possessions, and the things of this world. You get married for love, the love of God. You get married because God sent you this person. You need to love the person for the person and not bring in conditions. Well, I'll marry you if you're a good provider and you give me a new car every five years, whether I need one or not. Hello? 
really? You need to push that reset button and learn. If that's your attitude, you need to learn all over again what it means to have the proper motive in marriage. All right. She is wise and makes wise decisions. Proverbs 31, 26. Look at verse 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Oh, oy vey, my grandmother would say. One of the most embarrassing, humiliating things I have ever seen in a marriage for a husband and for their children is a wife who is foolish with her words. Almost every time, not every time, but almost every time she opens her mouth comes foolishness that casts a, a negative shadow on Christ and on the whole family. And the husband has to hang his head in shame. I've seen husbands in conversations with both of them in marriage. I've seen his countenance drop like that, like a lead balloon. It goes right down. Because out from her mouth comes stupidity and foolishness. She has no restraint on her words, or very little. Marry a woman that will not cause you embarrassment like that. Marry a godly woman who has enough power of the Holy Spirit working in her heart to restrain her words in the multitude of words Sin is not lacking, the Bible says. And so if you're one of those women who fall into that category, pray right now before you get married. Pray that God will give you a change in your thoughts before you speak them to learn how to rein them in and ask yourself a question before you speak a questionable statement. Should I say that? Should I say that? And so we need to keep that in mind. All right, we'll stop there and take, take uh, some questions. We have one. Go to your mouse and click on the message section of YouTube and Facebook and send us your questions, your comments on characteristics of a godly woman, on any topic related to marriage, marriage problems, relationship issues, as well as generic questions about the Bible. You can also send your question or comment to this email address, which is found on our website as well, um, cbc at christbiblechurch.org, cbc at christbiblechurch.org. All right, we do have a question. <clears throat> Owen says... Can you speak to a danger of a prospective husband unrealistically measuring a prospective wife against the absolute high standard of Proverbs 31? Good question, Owen. If you remember last Wednesday's study, I elaborated uh, at length about the characteristics of a godly woman as depicted in Proverbs 31 being the ideal. It's the perfect standard. Now, nobody can attain perfection except by the grace of God, but Jesus teaches us to strive for perfection. He actually commands us in the Sermon on the Mount to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And this criteria of perfection means that you're to be perfect in everything that God requires of us and that he commands us. And so this includes uh, the, a godly wife's uh, personality, her attitude, her words, her communication, faithfulness and, and in her role. And if a husband is bringing the, the perfect model of a godly wife as seen in Proverbs 31 and Titus 2 and projects it on his wife and imposes it on his wife. He puts this lens over her and he sees her 
as always less than perfect because he has this standard and expectation of perfection, then from day one, he is setting his marriage up for a major fall. No. The Bible has some things to say about what we're to strive for in obedience to God in every role, every responsibility we have, every commandment God gives us. But at the same time, the Bible has a lot to say about when we ourselves and others who are close to us, actually anybody, fall short of this standard. How do we respond to somebody that we observe hypocrisy in? How, how do we respond to someone who is weak? How do we respond to someone who we observe sins in a particular way? Well, the Bible says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We don't justify their sin. We don't condone that sin, but we don't judge them for that sin. The Bible says to pray for them that despitefully, despitefully use you and persecute you. The Bible says, love your enemies. The Bible says that we're to take the log out of our own eye before we try to take the speck out of someone else's eye. The Bible says, do not judge for the same measure you judge, it will be measured back to you. So there are many, many texts of scripture that teach us to be slow to judge, find fault with people in your thoughts, as well as in your actions, as well as in condemning other people. The Bible says that we're to pray for them, we're to be patient with them. And this is especially true in the husband-wife relationship, because you'll be living together every single day for many or most hours of the day, you'll be with your husband or your wife, and you need to give each other a lot of space because each one of you, each one of the spouses, is on a lifelong path of growth. And that pathway of growth lasts a lifetime, and it's somewhere along the line on that timetable that God has you grow out of bad habits and besetting sins. You get more and more victory over sin uh, every, over a lifetime. And sanctification happens incrementally throughout the duration of your entire life. This is very relevant and practical for the husband-wife relationship. The Bible commands husbands to be shepherds with his wife. That includes, and it means, being patient and long-suffering when he sees his wife's faults. He's not to jump down her throat, condemn her. He's to be sympathetic with her weakness and need without, as I said, justifying her sin or giving her any leeway at all to find, to to stretch out over the long term her continued practice of the sin because her husband said, oh, that's okay, honey. It's only a little sin. It's, it's a, only a white lie. It's, uh, you, you tried your best. You fulfilled the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law. Try better next time. It's okay, honey. Well, if you, if you give a, a carnal saint an inch, he or she will take a mile. Our flesh always takes the path of least resistance. So husband, be careful on the one hand that you don't condone a wife's sin. In your efforts to be comforting and consoling to your wife, you end up justifying in her, her in her sin and giving her an excuse not to immediately repent of that sin because you're, you're giving her too much sympathy. Too much. So she's getting the impression that that you're okay and even God is okay with taking her time in dealing with her sin. No, you need, you need to let her know that you're praying for her. It would be okay to say, honey, I know, I know you had a rough day yesterday and you and I both are reeling from that argument we got in yesterday and one of us went to bed uh, with the sun going down on our wrath, and we haven't reconciled yet, honey, but let's pray together. Instead of condemning your wife and confronting your wife in a hostile way and, and making her defensive and making her feel condemned, go to her in a way 
without justifying her sin, but as a shepherd would draw her into you. Say to her something like, honey, we, we should really pray about what happened yesterday. And I love you, honey. And I'm sorry I said those things to you. And, and don't focus on her sin. You focus on your sin and draw her in with words that will bring about a remedy to the situation without confronting her and condemning, condemning her directly. Most women are not stupid. They can connect the dots. And once they sense your spirit of kindness and you reaching out and trying to be a peacemaker between her and God and between her and you, she will warm up 99.9% .9 of the time. She will be drawn into you. And during the prayer or during your overture to reconcile with her, usually her heart will be softened and she will somewhat be melted with a sense of her own sin and her own fault. And most of the time, if she is saved anyway, she will come to you and apologize. Or at least in her prayer, she will confess her sin to God and she will confess how she has sinned against you. And after, after the prayer is over, usually she'll hug you or she'll apologize or everything will, in one way or another, will be behind you. That's what I would recommend, husbands. Um, don't be unrealistic in your expectation, but you be the one to take the low place and to bring about the reconciliation. Focus on yourself. Take the blame for those problems and those sins that you committed and that will prepare the groundwork for her to be reconciled to God and to you in your marriage. Don't throw up this, this unattainable, ultra-high standard of Proverbs 31 when you, you see her weaknesses. The Bible says she's weak or she's the weaker vessel, but you're still weak. Remember, the very next hour or the very next day, you could be the one totally at fault completely at fault, and then you find yourself having to, having to apologize to your wife. No, you make it easy for your wife. She's the weaker vessel. You're the one that needs to um, take the onus. Even though you may be hurt, even though she didn't apologize to you, give her a reason to reconcile with God and with you through your godly attitude, behavior, and your, your humility. All right, any other questions, Peter? Okay, no other questions? Well, we'll close it there then at um, 729. All right, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace you give husbands and wives to not only repair damage that has been done in marriages in the past, but you cause marriages to grow and increase in happiness and joy over the years. Thank you, Lord. Help every single person, especially the wives and the single women who are seeking to find a husband and are seeking to deepen and grow their godly character in preparation for marriage and just in general as a Christian wants to grow in the grace and knowledge of help them, Lord. And for those who don't have spouses, oh Lord, please remember them in their need, whether it be a woman or a man that needs a spouse, lead them to a godly spouse, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.